when, when I started my my journey into to automation back in the nineties, um, the best book that I could come across was a book written by uh, a lady called Dorothy Graham, who was the the first lady to ever write oh well the first person in the world to write automation code back in in the 1970s for for bell labs um and that first book which is still the best selling so book on test automation called uh, software test automation uh written by dot was kind of my bible it was kind of how pretty much everything which the last speakers just kind of covered how you modulize uh, reusable functionality, you know, how you make framework and automation and keyword driven and data driven. And, and, you know, yes, BDD wasn't quite around at the time, but, you know, everything else from an abstraction perspective was definitely there. Um, and I remember reaching out to Dorothy at the time and kind of saying to her, you know, I'm starting my automation career. Could you kind of give me some pointers? And um, I must admit, I, you know, um, she, uh, Dorothy's now on my weekly MIT call and she's contributing to the project that was introduced, for, which I'm working, uh, I'm now leading up for MIT. Um, and obviously Dorothy's been through all that. She's done 150 keynotes. Uh, she's probably one of the most influential women uh, in all this kind of space. And it's it's a pleasure to see her every week. And listen to kind of what she's looking at. And, you know, it's not just, you know, the standard checking, which we can kind of maybe associate with automation, but it's, you know, SEO, it's kind of accessibility. It's looking at things that maybe are questioning why why we're doing this or why the, the, it's designed in a particular way. And, and I, I love that um, critical thinking, which I guess is, is the foundation of what um, every tester has to be, right? Um, so, you know, have we really come that far? Have we come in the last 25, 30 years, have we suddenly picked up um, some kind of critical mass that we're, we're, we're really good at automation? Um, I think the answer probably is no, <laughs> which is slightly depressing. Um, Richard did say he can't see any slides. So let me just check on my area just to see if he can't. Um, let me just try sharing again. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So thanks, Richard, for that quick call out. So, yeah, so th that is the kind of the big question. Have we really moved that far? And, you know, I, I, I caught up with a friend of mine, Wayne Ariola, who, who formed uh, a company called Parasoft, which was probably a, um, a huge uh, test automation organization through the years. And, you know, he was still having this problem and he, he was the he was the general manager of Tricentis and uh, at the time. And he kind of said, shared with these stats what you see in front of you at the moment around um, automation during, as part of the software development lifecycle. And, you know, they, they, were, they were quite depressing numbers, right? And, you know, it was this kind of, you know, well, what's the test, what, what percentage of all test testing is automated, right? And, you know, as you can see here, 15%, that seems quite low. And, you know, I remember, you know, especially in the 90s, uh, the end of the 90s, you know, my, my target figure was always 70%. 70 Cover, trying to get 70% automated, anything after 74% became quite diminishing returns. So you know, to, to be thinking that maybe only 15% of most organizations' pipeline and of testing is, is automated is quite concerning. And, and this was a survey that was done uh, for all the Tricenters customers. And, and um, it, 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 was, it was quite scary in the sense of, if we look at the numbers that are coming out of things like the World Quality Report, um, you know, which also kind of supports this kind of metrics is so what so why are they so low because we personally know as test automation people that we, we can do a lot more. Um, and yeah, I think it's true, you know, the pockets of organizations are probably running at the 70 80% you know mark I'm never going to really talk about the 100% uh, mark but yeah, you know, I think we, we we're trying to go on that journey and you know, part of when we look at the 15%, we're probably talking about as, a, as an organization. Um, and, you know, I've worked for people like Facebook and Apple and PayPal, and, and I was based in Silicon Valley for a number of years. And I've sat there with their automation frameworks and their approach to automation. And it's still the same, right? These numbers aren't, you know, going to explode suddenly and go, well, these guys are doing it in, in, the, in Silicon Valley better than maybe what you guys are, are doing now who are listening. Um, but I think there is some challenges and I, I really want to kind of hopefully help with this in the sense of kind of at least give people some direction into, well, how do we move the needle? Right. And, you know, 
of course, when I was in in Silicon Valley, I was I was there uh, as part of an acquisition f- uh, made by one of the largest software players in the, on the planet um, for a company that did two things. It did model based testing uh, with a tool called Agile Designer. It also did the biggest uh, product in the world for test data management, a product called TDM. Surprise, surprise, not very creative. Um, and, you know, so we were we were sat in this test data automation landscape as well. And, and that was why Apple and a few other companies had approached us to, to help them with their kind of uh, data, test data challenges. And again, those numbers have been able to synthetically or create, uh, obfuscate data or, you know, go and generate the data that you need for testing is still is still something today that's not, you know, seen as, as fully automated. So, so, you know, why did I start with this kind of, you know, very grand, exciting vision of, of hyper automation and, um, and model-based testing or the second generation of model-based testing? And so the reason that I started with that is, um, you know, I'm starting to see and I'm going to explain on my last slide just to keep people, everyone happy. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to share all the links uh, to GitHub repositories, which can give you all of this capability for free. Right. Um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, this I, I think the whole point and you can see the link that I put there with the guys, Hugh Price and the guys that I'd worked with um, while I was in Silicon Valley. You know, they've just created a, with with the help of Wayne as well from Tricentis, previously at Tricentis, um, around an open test platform where you don't have to worry about is it Cypress? Should it be, you know, Test Cafe? Should it be, you know, this or that? Should I manage all that level of complexity? And, and you know, when we, we we brought model based testing to to people at like Apple and to other kind of big, large or global organizations, you know, we could we could generate any automation code. We could generate your UFT, QTP, WinRunner, whatever it was. You could generate your uh, your scripts from Selenium or your API calls from you know Rest Assured or you know uh, Postman or wherever you know you're you're using, right? So, but the ability to generate automation artifacts is n- not the the challenge here. It's how do you do it at speed? And I think this is where this kind of this this hyper automation comes in and i found the best definition i could find as you can see on the left kind of said you know it's the ability of extending the tools so it's not just automation tools here it's every tool that you need it's your sv tools it's your so your shims and stub tools it's your test data tools it's your test execution engines it's your containerization it's your you know the whole you know being able to deal with the relationship of when something changes in in the kind of bdd landscape um so i want to cover it all and what I liked about this definition for hyper automation was also the fact that they talked about a number of different phases. They talked about design, discover, automate and analyze, measure, monitor, reassess. And I love that. It felt like it was in the early days of AMMI. So the automation maturity models, it was starting to put some structure around how we automate, uh, which we kind of kind of lost. Um, and what uh, Wayne and the guidance have, have put with their link below was kind of saying that the trigger point needs to be act. It needs to be something that is triggered within your organization. So that could be someone's changed some code in the, the repository. And that is the trigger point for your code to change. But it could also be that there's an issue found um, in service, a ticket in service now that means you, that things need to change so there has to be something that's a trigger to start this entire process off it's not a sequential linear software development life cycle of requirements you know engineering down and then iterate it has to be uh, much more than that so what i've done is i've taken the model which i'm i'm just about to go to publish with um so my last book last year was um Accelerating software quality, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. This was done with people like uh, some of my good friends, like Jason Arben, who's the uh, test test uh, AI, and, and Tarek, uh, and other thought leaders in the space. Of course, I also contributed with Dot for the follow up to that best selling book, which was Experiences in Test Automation, which I think I've got on uh, one of these slides. Uh, but I'm just about to publish a book uh, with the BCS. Um, publication team around cognitive engineering. So this was with Rex Black and um, originally Angie Jones and and a few other uh, thought leaders in the space. And I wanted to kind of really kind of focus on shift right, which is something I've been talking about maybe over the last 10 years, 
Um, and I wanted to explore the stuff that I covered on my TED talk, which was cognitive engineering or cognitive learning, um, which was a very simple model and is still something I think, you know, we're still missing in in the industry. And, and, and so, you know, part of this model was, OK, how do we do that thinking and how do we, you know, what is the action that's driving us to actually trigger some activity? And that could be in the case of, you know, a, a requirement. It could be a story. It could be, a, uh, a, you know, like we mentioned on the previous, it could be a feature. It could be whatever that is. Um, it's it's triggering uh, our thought or our conceptual understanding of what the software should do or, or, in essence, a model. Right. So, you know, part of it is we know how something works. We we visualize it in our mind. Maybe we've got, you know, visio diagrams that we look at. And then partly what we do as as automation engineers, I suppose, is is is, is covered on the previous um, speaker, where we 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 potentially going to build some something, and, and and maybe that could be include some kind of code solution, and then we're going to test it, make sure it works. It could be TDD, BDD, ATDD, you know, Elizabeth Henderson, Dan North, all the greats. You know, it could be Goiko specification by example. I don't really care. Um, it's it's all it's all just um, semantics, right? Um, but what to me is the only is the really important bit is the learning bit is how do you learn from it? Now, of course, with machine learning and AI and, and the stuff what we cover in the book, which covers also the MIT COVID outbreak, which I covered um, in the previous session. I'm going to kind of cover a little bit extended today was how do we learn about what's happening in the real world to then inform our testing? And, you know, partly the stuff that I used to demo to, to, the, to the Gartners and the Foresters and the Diegos of the world was, uh, and in, this is five years ago, literally a way to, you know, turn on APMs and then generate all models and all test automation scripts for mobile and UI automatically and API. You know, I could do that five years ago and, and I didn't need to automate anything. Um, so, you know, and this was all from learning what was happening in the real world. So like an apple you know millions of trans hundreds of millions of transactions coming through the app store you know being able to use those as the deltas to generate all the models to generate all the tests to then retest the system based on real user behavior so you know this is what i've been talking about for a very long time and i you know and there's tools there and i've, I've kind of covered it in enough detail i think and i'm sorry i'm not going to cover it again i really want to share more around the modeling for you. But I've overlaid those same hyper automation terminology from a kind of a wiki page to what we're actually talking about now. And it, it maps pretty much the same, you know, design, discover, automate, analyze, measure, reassess. You know, that's the same methodology, whether you're doing hyper automation, automation, or even testing, you know, part of it is the same mapping exercise. So that book will be coming available in the next uh, couple of months. So I spend all my time, I spent all this morning and I'm going to spend most of the day tomorrow uh, working with, with uh, my good friend, Paul Gerrard and um, Paul, who's globally recognized in the testing landscape, won numerous testing awards um, and recognition over his time. You know, he brought this into the BBC uh, and he literally said, testing's dead. And, you know, being the BBC and, and you know, we've, we've just seen what's happened with um you know, win, uh, opera, uh, win, uh, with the royal family, right, is that, you know, they got quite a reaction. He kind of is, is testing really dead. And, and, and I know Jace, uh, James Whitaker had said something very similar, who was who wrote the book on how Google test. And he, you know, he his view was, uh, is testing dead? And, I, and the whole point was, and the reason why he published this article, you know, 2014, um, saying, no, it's it's we need to think of a new a, a new model for testing, right? Uh, and this is what I debate with him on on some days, but I kind of given up because he's always right. But um, it still fits into that same um, kind of model that we just talked out before. I'm not going to map it on again because uh, I don't want to get him to tell me off. But um, but you know, part of what he's saying here is, well, why would you model something? Well, you would model something because. You know, you've got sources of knowledge, you've got knowledge coming from requirements, you've got knowledge from the business, you've got knowledge from docs and specs and all this in stuff. And what you're doing is you're exploring those models and you're creating a model, you re you're refining it, you, you know, and you're testing the hypothesis out as you go. Um, but by default, models are inadequate and they're also typically wrong. So you have to be able to refine them and only through this refinement process, re refinement process is when you realize 
that you've actually got a model which is quite accurate. And sometimes that model could be, you know, the real world, right? Um, so, you know, like I said, you know, this isn't something new. Um, and I'm back in 2010 when I uh, did the book with Dorothy and uh, and, the, and Alan Page, who wrote the book on how Microsoft tests, uh, and we created this book called Experiences of Test Automation. You know, my section in the book was uh, I'd put this diagram in. And, and at that point in time, we were kind of calling it business process automation. But, you know, what was the fundamentals were the, this business process modeling notation, which is an OMG standard um, for modeling, right? And so when you went to university, you will have seen, um, you know, UML uh, and, and other forms of modeling, which you would have learned. Uh, and business process modeling notation is, is one of those types. Um, and I put in the book, and I don't know if it was just because I weren't, I didn't know the answer to it at the time. I was, I was kind of trying to get people to, to, to say, well, how many possible permutations and routes through this incredibly simple process is there? And this was something I'd automated for uh, the Lottery Commission in New Zealand. So I was in New Zealand at the time, and and it was interesting because to me, I was looking at it and I was going, oh, well, there's 25 paths, there's 30, let's call them happy paths for a second. Um and then obviously I met Hugh, which, you know, and, and spent a lot of time with Hugh and kind of realized that actually it's endless, right? Because think about the amount of different numbers to the lottery. That's just the buy tickets. So just the combinations within that, you know, buy ticket and the checking permutations is just, you know, millions upon millions. And then I realized that <laughs> model-based testing was was hard. And then I also realized that actually made a lot more sense to model it than and and we talked about the last speaker talked about modulization and abstraction you know by using bdd well this is bdd just using diagrams right um so anyway so part of that is things have moved on i call this model based testing 1.0 because it's 10 years old now <clears throat> sorry 11 years old um so i sit as the chair for the model based testing iso standard um, so obviously I can't share it with you, otherwise I would lose my job. Um, but I'm responsible for gathering some of the smartest minds uh, in the modeling, uh, model-based testing landscape to talk about putting an ISO standard down. So I know we talked about DB3C on the last session, which is obviously a way of getting Selenium as a kind of a default. And OMG was a, a great standard for bringing things like UML and, and business process modeling notation to, to quicker than what an ISO, an international standards organization, would be to bring their standard in. So, but what I took is the entire 80 page document and I just put it into a cloud map to kind of give you a, a kind of a, sh a view of, well, what is this all about? You know, what is model-based testing? And, and you know, if you go went off to someone like Richard Bender or Dick Bender, you know, you, you he'd tell you all about modeling and cause and effect modeling. And, you know, um, it, it, yes, there's lots of parts to it, but I wanted to kind of explain to you it in principle. So, I haven't actually got the book to my hand, but um, um, I bought the model-based testing essentials book off um, off Amazon uh, literally a week and a half ago after sitting through one of the ISO meetings. And it's got the original ISTQB, um, as you see, I'm making a whole stack of notes on it. Uh, the, the original ISTQB cert certificate around model-based testing. Now, this was published, or the ISO uh, IT, uh, ISTQB standard around model-based testing was about 2014, 2015, and it covers a very similar structure. Um, so if you are really interested to it, I'm gonna cover that later on, and it's a free download. You can download that as well. Everything I'm mentioning here is free. Um, but these are the kind of core components that I'm gonna go through today and try and help express those in the best possible way. Um, and I thought I'd do it with COVID because obviously the last conversation we had was around COVID and I wanted to cover it again uh, in the sense of I wanted to talk to you about, well, what is, you know, what is everyone doing or what you're doing at the moment? And I guess, you know, um, also whilst writing these slides, which I literally wrote in the last week, um, I also um contracted covid which is probably not the best so i kind of got to about day three as you'll probably see through one of the later models and then realized there was a choice between should i cancel and not turn up to this or should i hope by the day that i've got to do it that actually i feel a little bit more alive which which i do 
Um, but, you know, my inner start and over a year that I've been working with the guys at MIT now, um, helping them with automation and, and all, the, all the QA stuff, you know, I, I, I've been doing this. And, you know, I've, to be honest, I've, I've been happy as Larry because, you know, I, I, this is kind of what I was designed to do. But, you know, I stay at home. You know, I, I didn't really go out. I didn't, don't really interact with anybody. You know, I do my work, uh, you know, and I'm, I, and that's the repeat. And the only thing what differs is deliveries. And that's things like food deliveries to get, you know, groceries. And it's also deliveries from things like Amazon. So if I need a book, like the book that I just ordered on model-based testing uh, from Amazon. So, you know, they're the only interactions with other people I have on the planet at the moment. And with with a mask uh, whenever I have the chance to run to a door or maybe without a mask if I'm um, on a call. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I kind of um, went through this process, I suppose. And literally, as I was about to start writing these slides, which I apologize if one of the slides doesn't make that much sense. But um, I, you know, I had really bad trouble breathing. Um, I started getting a really high temperature. And then I, I, I dialed 111, which is our kind of non emergency services. And I said, Look, um you know i think i might have covid uh what should i do and they said stay at home right and self-isolate which which is great but you can see through the model with a subflow that actually my symptoms are a component of the original model right the original model kind of said you know stay at home accept deliveries be covid free stay safe right but if i have symptoms or don't have any symptoms that is a subflow and that subflow could be incredibly complex. In this case, it was quite simple. It was just my symptoms. Um, but let me apply that BDD. So this is this um, cucumber kind of viewpoint, I suppose, of the landscape. And, you know, I spent enough time. I spent um, uh, two weeks with with Dan North when I was at a star conference once uh, talking to him about um, behavior driven development and, and what it was supposed to be and maybe not what it is now. But, um, you know, it was about behaviors, behaviors of the, the components that we talked about. And on the right hand side, which is an inc incredibly sneak preview, this is what we're, I'm, I'm helping develop at the moment for MIT, which is the vaccine passport. So it's the ability to, as some of you will probably be able to at the moment, is to go in, be able to scan the bottle um, on the, the side of the bottle for the, the QR, uh, tell you what do dose it is, uh, and then save it in once you've got your second dose um, and you've got full cover, then uh, you get a passport to your, a digital passport to your phone. So then if you went to an airport, you wouldn't be, you'd be able to fly to another country, right? Which is the goal of maybe the next generation of what we're doing. Whereas previously I was doing contract tape tracing, which was using the Bluetooth proximity stuff to work out if you'd interacted with anyone. This is now around, you know, the next step in the process of, of taking to, vaccines getting your dose and then being able to actually resume back to normal life so a bit of a sneak preview of what we're doing at the moment so yeah so the last few months i've been in lockdown proper lockdown in the uk for the last three months um so i've been covid free which has been great i take deliveries that they could potentially be greater than or equal to daily they could be more less or more um but the problem is what I had last week was I had a two day period, which I was obviously infected from. So prior to that two days, somebody who gave me who came and gave me a delivery also gave me COVID. Um, but I didn't know because I, I didn't feel any symptoms. Two days, completely fine. Um, but then I then started seeing uh, this high fever and struggle breathing and um, and at that point, I'm guessing somewhere I was between this five to day five and to day six, uh, where I, I will, I've obviously been infectious to other people in my household. But at that point, I didn't realize. Um, and I then needed to do incubation. So I'm guessing now I'm in my incubation period of 14 days. Um, so if I was able to go <clears throat> have this application, which we don't have in the UK, we just write it all on uh, a piece of paper um uh, at the moment which is pretty bad um but you know i should get a notification from the uk government at some point saying you know come and get your jab have you been symptom free for 14 days yes i have therefore i should be able to move on to the next level at uh, lex one um there is a question around being able to give you more links about the hyper automation I, i'll put that link in 
Uh, but yet, yeah, I can give you more technical detail on any of these. Anyway, so that's a behavior model, which I guess is very much your BDD kind of landscape. So, so what's cognitive learning got to do with this? And, and again, I'm going to a bit of a, a sneak preview on the right hand side, which is um, the what we're using now. We're also developing, which is a a vaccine um, as part of the vaccine passport. Is this um, ability to actually then print out uh, a um, kind of a passport so you can travel? Um, so this is the other area. Um, so this is you know a really interesting one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> someone's going for the pairwise testing so yeah so um so anyway so we can so where does model-based testing come in when you've got to deal with you know data and 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 this is where i think suddenly get things get interesting and so within the iso standard there is a, a definition of online versus offline mode which i'm still trying to get that definition a little bit more um clarified but let's apply machine learning right for a second let's think about um I guess the question that's kind of coming in around analytics, right? Let's think about we're starting to use machine learning with all the data that we're getting. We're getting, you know, side effects. So I get my jab and then I've got a side effect and that could be I've got a uh, one of those side effects is I've, you've got a runny nose or something. So, of course, it's learning from all the different data that's happening, all the people who are actually getting these jabs. And then to make things more complex, um, uh, you know, and I think is kind of a slightly concerning thing, but it was one of the things I noticed quite early on. So if I'd gone to get my injection today, I, I'd have a choice between two. I'd either have the Pfizer jab or I'd have the Oxford, Ox, uh, Oxford back, uh, batch, right? And, you know, I think the problem is that the people don't realize that one's only 62%, gives me 62% um, uh, protection. The other one gives me 95 from from the first jab. Um so one of them is obviously not very efficient, effective as the, compared to the other one. So there's an effect. I could potentially have had the Oxford vaccination first. Ha, I could be a certain age, let's say in my 40s, and I could also be having certain side effects, which I'm reporting using the app. Um, and the machine learning is suddenly going, OK, wait a second. John, Jonathan's had two of these Oxford uh, jabs. He's also in a certain age group. He's at a certain health. And therefore, should I be giving him the print pass key now so that he can travel to another country and potentially infect a lot of people? And somewhere behind the scenes, someone's something is making a decision. So this is where, you know, the question then kind of comes in to say, well, what is making that decision? And, you know, for those people who've who've done things like Monte Carlo algorithms in the past, you know, part of it is they've looked at it and gone, OK, so same data in, different data out every time. OK, this is a problem to do an assertion on, right? Same thing goes here with machine learning. We're, we're looking at it and, you know, uh, we could be, let's make it simplify it for a second, but we could be using equivalent cl classes for a second and we could say, OK, so I'm, I'm going to go through the 18 to 44 route if, if that's what I'm doing, which is only 3.9% of the deaths based on the current one of the API feeds that's feeding into this machine learning, you know, um, it could be something like Snowflake or some some kind of platform or some graph day, uh, knowledge graph like GraphQL, uh, GraphDB, sorry, like Neo4j. You know, part of it is this data is coming in, it's changing it, the algorithm's running, it's optimizing the data out and it's making a decision based on the side effects that I have, the sample sets that it has, and it's then deciding to either put, do a pop up saying, no, do not issue Jonathan with a, a travel passport or or not. And, and and I may have not ever, ever seen that functionality of do not issue because that, that's an edge case, just like someone's asking there around, you know, pairwise testing. You know, part of it is, yes, pairwise testing is great for covering all possible paths through the system. But is it going to optimize? Uh, it's Yes, it's going to optimize the minimum amount of sets of tests that you need, but that's not going to be very helpful when you're doing something like contact tracing or vaccination testing, because there's going to be out, uh, there's going to be edge cases. And one of those edge cases could be if you fit under a certain set of different variables, which it never tells you because it's a black box, then a new feature is going to pop up and say, no, sorry, we're not able to uh, issue you. So, I might may have never seen this scenario or, or the team, the MIT, uh, MIT guys may have not told me that this feature exists as part of the flow. So can my model detect it and 
and actually deal with it? Well, of course it can, right? We, you know, this is not difficult in the sense of it sees a screen, it needs to deal with, it's a new screen, it deals with it, right? But it's a lot better if you've got, which is why the shift right approach that I talk about, if you've got millions of possible uh, data points to actually take, so millions of different people using the application, which is what we have now with the original contact tracing application, you know, then when these pop-ups or these issues or errors appear, we catch them and then we go back through and go, okay, well, why was this flow different? What was the vaccination batch they were using? What was the, you know, what did the algorithm do to actually make a decision that this person wasn't, um, shouldn't be traveling? So, you know, part of it is, I think there's a lot of complexity around this. And I think modeling, it moves a lot of that, com removes a lot of that complexity. And and so therefore, you know, I think it's, it's something that I'd, I'd like you all to be, to think about. And I know I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to kind of push on a couple of topics and then get to some of your questions. But, um, you know, go and check out the uh, the ISTQB Foundation, which, I, you know, I would never normally kind of say go and look at the certification side of things first. But you can download from the ISTQB.org. You can download the entire syllabus for model-based testing and get to know it um, and understand it a little bit and understand it in its application towards testing, right? So for you guys there, we're thinking, oh, I want to do model-based testing what kind of testing can I do? How does it work? You know, what's the value of it? What's the drawbacks of doing it this way? Of course, there's drawbacks, right? It's not that, it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't just fix all your problems. Last time I showed you this, which I'm not going to show you again because, um, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, we already explored it. But, you know, when we were doing our contact tracing and we, this is originally for GPS, which was when we were based on GPS, not for games, which is the Google and, and Apple exposure notifications, which you've all got now enabled on your phone, whether you like it or not. Um, you know, back then we were using a digital twin. So we we're using the real world um, scenario where it went through and discovered all permutations. And then it created all possible test cases. And yes, it could have t created them all in Selenium. It could have created them all in Appium. It could have created them in something else. Um, you know, it's it. Uh, that's to me, it's it's is a side thing. You know, but what was important about this, and I think it answers your question, uh, uh, which you, one of the questions that kind of came in, is you know, how do you deal with all those type of journeys? Well, in this case. You know, as far as pairwise, I think, you know, you're talking about 241 test cases generated out of the back of that single model, which you're looking at now. And then from possible, you know, permutations of all paths, you know, that's 9,589 paths. It took us five hours to generate this and it, to, to run all the automation against um, on any device, on it, whether it be uh, an Apple uh, or, or Android device using the same model five hours you know if you can do it if we can do it in five hours then you can do it in five hours you know that's suddenly a lot of testing done and we still use this for testing this path check application but the, now the gains is a bit more difficult because obviously it's a hardware level and therefore we're back down to to dealing with apis um and mocks and shims and stubs which because we're not focusing on a on a pretty ui well there is a ui but it's not that pretty um and it doesn't have things like you expose your history. Well, it does, but it's not to the same level. And most of you have got a, a version of this anyway. So anyway, so I, I, I said I would give you a list of a whole stack of products that will actually allow you to go and do pretty much 80, 90% of what I talked about today. Um, and then obviously there's a lot more to it, but I wanted you to get started and have some stuff to, to go off and play with, um, to go off and think about um, so the first one, which I wanted to kind of bring to people's attention, I'm sure they've already seen it, is uh, to create all component and unit tests automatically. You know, you can go and use Diff Blue. You know, the previous speaker talked about Java. You know, whatever code's written, it will go off and generate unit tests for that. You know, I personally use Evo Suite because it's um, it's free and it's open source. But, you know, you can plug those libraries in and it will generate your unit tests for your build. So you can then get whatever kind of code coverage you want him to get from your, you know, your Sunit Sony cubes or whatever else in the world. Right. So it's, it's easy to do. That's easy enough to do. And it's great to see the application of AI in doing component testing. 
Um, I was impressed this week, uh, which is why I put it in. My friend Alon, who I used to work with in when I was in Silicon Valley, who fat, was the founder of uh, of Blaze Meter, who's also one of the the co contributors to the biggest, second biggest contributor to J Meter Standard. Um, you know, he's just launched another um, another platform called Mockintosh, which is uh, a bit like Wiremock. I, you know, as far as it's that, he obviously he did. Uh, he also did the. Um, I've completely bl- uh, forgot for a second. He did Taurus as well, but so that gives you mocks and stubs. But Up Nine actually creates or uh, uses AI to generate all permutations of, of API tests. So for those people who are you know wanting to learn a bit more about uh, doing API testing or automated API testing. Mm-hmm.